bone-chilling, frigid winds scream across the frozen landscape of the South Pole. It is one of the most inhospitable regions on the planet, with its biting temperatures and winters of perpetual darkness. The Antarctic continent repels human habitation, yet several hundred call it home for periods of the year. In May 2000, Rodney Marks, one of the astrophysicists residing at the Amundsen-Scott Research Station, is walking between two of the compound's facilities when he begins to feel ill. His symptoms gradually worsen until only a day later, he succumbs to his ailment and passes away. The weather forbids a post-mortem until six months later when a fatal quantity of methanol is found in his system. How he ingested this poison becomes a mystery as perpetual as an Antarctic winter. A doctor curiously disappears, corporate subterfuge is suspected, and claims begin to swirl that this is the first recorded murder at the South Pole. But the truth about what happened to Rodney Marks remains unknown, leading to a story that will be told for decades. The ferocity of the Antarctic winter. There is no greater land mass on the planet, mostly inhospitable to human life, than Antarctica. It is the fifth largest continent on Earth and is classified as a polar desert. Its winds are sharp and frozen, and the ground is covered in a mild, dense sheet of ice. Antarctica is governed by around 55 countries, all of whom are parties to the Antarctic Treaty System, an international agreement that forbids mining, nuclear testing, and military activity on the continent. Countries such as Argentina, Russia, and China have large presences on the landscape. The United States also operates research facilities, including the Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station. It is here where the mystery of Rodney Marx's death begins. Named after Roald Amundsen and Robert F. Scott, the first two people to lead teams to the South Pole in the early 1900s, the Amundsen-Scott Station is located at the southernmost tip of the United States jurisdiction on the continent. It is operated and maintained by the Office of Polar Programs, a subdivision of the National Science Foundation. Some operations are also contracted out to Raytheon Polar Services. The station is the only habitation on Earth that is entirely shielded from the sun for six months of the year. Overnight, temperatures can drop to as low as negative 73 Celsius or negative 99 Fahrenheit. During these winter months, fearsome storms regularly erupt, producing dangerous blizzards and gale force winds that ravish the landscape. But in the intermittent periods, the location's true beauty can be seen. The sky becomes clear and littered with excellent astronomical opportunities. The brutality of the cold may be enduring, but the respite periods are a thing for the imagination. The Amundsen-Scott facility has been expanded since its initial inception in 1956 to comprise a wider array of buildings, including power plants, a clean air facility, and a geodesic dome at its heart. A symbolic pole lies within the compound's grounds, marking the geographic location of the Earth's magnetic south. The station's resident staff occupy living quarters in the dome for the time they are there. During more recent winter periods, lasting from March to September, staffing levels may only be as high as a few dozen people. In May 2000, as the bitter winds of winter had already begun to set in, the station was populated by 50 people, including an astrophysicist named Rodney Marks.
Chapter 1 The Life of an Astrophysicist Rodney Marks was born in 1968 in Geelong, Australia. He was 32 years old at the time of his death and had experienced Tourette's syndrome since he was a child. Marx was an Australian national who has been described by a colleague as being a brilliant, witty, and steady sort of bloke. His academic achievements were wide and commendable. He received his education at the University of Melbourne before moving on to pursue a PhD at the University of South Wales. His true passions lay in the field of astrophysics, which was the trajectory that brought him to the South Pole. Marx had spent the winter of 1997 to 1998 at the Amundsen Scott Station, absorbing its beauty and opportunities for scientific research. He was then employed by the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and returned to the station in 2000 to begin work on the Antarctic Submillimeter Telescope and Remote Observatory. Marx's connection to the station grew even further when he met Sonia Walter, who had also been working at the station. The two grew closer, eventually becoming engaged. Volter sought residence at the station at the same time as her now fiancé, and the two, alongside over colleagues, bunkered down for the long, dark winter. But in May 2000, as the season was underway, their happiness would come to a tragic, mysterious end as Rodney Marx's strange illness began. Chapter 2. The Timeline of Rodney's Illness and Death Winter was in full force, shrouding the Amundsen-Scott station in a darkness that would only end months later. But the critical scientific research needed to continue unabated by the weather. On the 11th of May 2000, Rodney Marx was walking between the remote observatory of the station and its base of operations. In a matter of moments, he began to feel strangely unwell. His breathing became labored. He felt utterly exhausted, and his vision was becoming blurred and obfuscated. Worried, he visited the station's medical doctor, Robert Thompson, who was stumped by Marx's ailment. He suspected that alcohol withdrawal may have been the culprit, as Marx was known to be a heavy drinker. But instead, he opted to reassure his patient and send him on his way. A day later, at 5.30 a.m., Marx awoke to the horrifying realization that his symptoms had not only persisted, but worsened. He began to vomit blood, and he experienced great pain when moving his muscles and joints. His eyes had also become excessively sensitive to even the low wattage light of the station's bulbs, necessitating the use of sunglasses. Panic-stricken, Marx made his second visit to Dr. Thompson. His diagnosis was that Marx was experiencing a panic attack, and the treatment was the administration of a sedative injection allowing Marx to get some well-needed rest. This notion, however, would prove fruitless. Hours later, Rodney Marx returned to the doctor for the third and final time. His unusual symptoms were continuing to get worse, and he was now in a state of abject terror. Hyperventilation had set in, making treatment problematic. Dr. Thompson then administered another injection to his patient, one dosed with the antipsychotic known as Haldol. Thompson would later testify that such medication was necessary due to Marx's erratic and panicked state. But 45 minutes after this treatment, Marx experienced a severe cardiac arrest 
from which he did not recover. In the space of 36 hours, Rodney Marks deteriorated from good health to death. The illness that ended his life remained undiagnosed and would continue that way for the next six months. The harsh Antarctic climate forbid the movement of Marx's body from the station to the mainland. Planes could not land or take off in the exceptional blizzards that were cold enough to freeze the engine fluid in a matter of moments. Thus, an autopsy was not immediately performed, and Marx's body remained in frozen storage for the entire winter period. When word eventually leaked into the wider world about his death, the National Science Foundation released a statement saying that Marx had apparently died of natural causes, but the specific cause of death has yet to be determined. Media outlets across the world latched onto the story, dubbing it the first murder at the South Pole. The true cause of Rodney Marx's death was held in limbo until his body was able to be extracted to Christchurch, New Zealand in November 2000. Spring had begun, ceasing the dark months and cold storms and illuminating the continent once more. As it turned out, however, his death had been the result of entirely unnatural causes. Chapter 3 the Investigation and Coroner's Inquest The Initial Postmortem Once Rodney Mark's body had been successfully transferred to Christchurch in November 2000, the long-awaited autopsy could finally be performed. The results were illuminating the doctor noted the presence of two mysterious injection sites on Mark's arms, but no detectable presence of illegal drugs in his system. Whether these were the result of Dr. Thompson's failed treatment attempts, or if they were present before that day, is unknown. More critically, however, the truth of how Mark's had died could finally be determined. It had not been an aneurysm, as some had first suspected, but a fatal dose of methanol. The chemical was widely available across the Amundsen-Scott station, as the solvent was present in cleaning agents used to sterilize scientific equipment. Marx had ingested a dose of approximately 150 milliliters, enough to fill a small wine glass. How he had come to ingest such a large quantity was a question the post-mortem could not answer. The initial analysis of Marx's body came simultaneous with the original theory that Marx had distilled his own alcohol and accidentally poisoned himself with methanol. He had apparently been known to be a heavy drinker, and there were no immediate signs that foul play may have been involved. There were issues with this theory, however, which we will discuss later. In the meantime, once the post-mortem had concluded, both the United States and New Zealand agreed to hold a coroner's inquest to firmly examine the facts of Marx's death. First, however, there needed to be an official police investigation. This would come to uncover some interesting and pertinent details about Marx's perplexing death. The Detective's Investigation The onset of the official investigation would eventually begin, but it first highlighted the issues around the governance of Antarctic territory. The base and most American operations on the continent, was located within the Ross Dependency Territory belonging to New Zealand. Supplies to the station were also dispatched from here. This occupancy has not been questioned by the United States government, but
but it has also never been formally acknowledged. There were issues regarding which country would conduct the investigation, but it was ultimately determined that the New Zealand police would undertake the inquiries. Detective Senior Sergeant DSS Wormald Grant at the New Zealand Police was assigned to the case under the direction of the Christchurch coroner, Richard McElry. The U.S. did not object to this directive, and the investigation could proceed unhindered. One of Wormald's first lines of inquiry was to determine the intent behind Marx's death, specifically whether he had committed suicide, fallen victim to an accident, or been killed. Suicide was immediately ruled out. Methanol consumption would have been a strange method of choice, and Marx had sought medical assistance once his symptoms had manifested. He had entered a new relationship which appeared to be going well, and his academic achievements had not declined. Marx also had no financial issues that would have explained potential mental health difficulties. As a result, DSS Wormald came to one clear conclusion, that Rodney Marx had unknowingly ingested the methanol, and a possible method in which this had occurred was through deliberate poisoning. At the time that news of Rodney Marx's death had leaked into the wider world, the National Science Foundation released a statement proclaiming that his demise had been the result of natural causes. Wormald was keen to know the information that directed them to such a conclusion. He requested access to the reports generated by internal investigations, as well as the names of the other people stationed at the Amundsen-Scott base at the time Marx had died. His requests were denied by both the NSF and Raytheon Polar Services, who undertook some operations at the site. The NSF also stated that no such report existed, though Wormald found it difficult to imagine that to be the case. The United States Department of Justice also requested information from both organizations, who again denied the request. This led Wormald to conclude that pertinent facts about Rodney Marx's death were being withheld from the police and the coroner for unknown reasons. Wormald's requests for the names of other staff at the base may have been denied, but the matter did not end there. Their names eventually became known after a roster of the station staff was obtained over the internet, although by whom I cannot determine. Forty-nine people were on the list, and most of them were American. Face-to-face -face access was clearly difficult, so an alternative method was devised. The New Zealand police constructed a questionnaire and sent it to everybody on the list. According to The Guardian, only 13 people responded. Wormald later told a local newspaper that he believed Marx's colleagues were hesitant to come forward out of fear that their employment would be threatened if they did. The information from the questionnaires that were received was unfortunately minimal, leading to a vacancy of relevant leads on which to work. DSS Wormald's investigation significantly slowed down as the flow of information began to cease, but it never came to an official end, which remains to this day. Despite the lack of cooperation by most parties involved, his overall conclusion remained the same. Rodney Marx had unknowingly consumed the methanol that killed him. All that remained was for the coroner to reconvene the investigation, although some time would pass before that day would arrive. The Coroner's Inquest The Christchurch Coroner, Richard McElry, reconvened the investigation into Rodney Marx's death in December 2006. 
One of the key issues brought up during the proceedings was the treatment Marx had received from Dr. Robert Thompson, the medical practitioner stationed at the Amundsen Scott base. Marx had visited him three times during the rapid development of his illness. The medical notes he had taken were the subject of scrutiny after another doctor stationed nearby reviewed them and determined that Thompson had fallen short of what he should have done for his patient. Additionally, Thompson had access to an ecticum blood analysis machine that, if used, would have provided critical information about Marx's condition. This did not take place, as Thompson claimed the machine was complicated to use and that its battery had been depleted and would require up to 10 hours to recharge. These claims were refuted by fellow doctors. Finally, Thompson's use of an antipsychotic injection was questioned. The administration of medication with tranquilizing effects in an undiagnosed patient exhibiting signs of liver failure was contended by other medical doctors. But Thompson defended its use, suggesting that Marx's panicked state made treatment virtually impossible. Whether this treatment choice was justifiable is a matter of opinion and dictated by hindsight. Nevertheless, the fact remains that Thompson's conduct was a significant point of contention throughout the inquest. After all of the relevant facts had been accumulated, the coroner's inquest was indefinitely adjourned until a later date. But before that could happen, Dr. Thompson disappeared. He made no contact with the media and other relevant authorities, and has not done so since the inquest in 2006. Where he went, and why he ceased involvement, is not known. Two years later, in September 2008, the written report of the coroner's inquest was released based on the police investigation and the facts gleaned from the official proceedings. There was no evidence that a prank had been played on Marx that had gone awry. There were also no signs that foul play had occurred or that Marx had committed suicide. The report did not reach a definitive conclusion as to how Rodney Marx ingested the methanol that killed him, a fact that remains true today. But in the absence of such a conclusion, Speculation has been rife about what may have happened on that cold, dark day. Chapter 4 The Theories Behind Rodney Mark's Poisoning There has, understandably, been a plethora of theories put forth potentially explain Rodney Marx's death over the years. One of the most prevalent ideas is that Marx may have accidentally consumed a fatal dose of methanol during the distillation process of homemade alcoholic spirits. Such activity was reportedly common at the facility amongst the many scientists stationed there, despite the wide availability of alcoholic drinks. Both methanol and ethanol, which is far less toxic, were used during this process, but both are colorless and almost entirely odorless. They may have been indistinguishable from one another, leading to a potential mix-up. This is substantiated further, as DSS Wormald's investigation uncovered information that suggested Marx's laboratory workspace was disorganized and messy. Bottles of lab agents were reportedly strewn between dozens of empty alcohol bottles. Plus, Marx had apparently been known to be a heavy drinker. If he had been slightly drunk at the time, the chances of him making a fatal mistake would have been increased. Could this explain how Marx came to ingest such a large quantity of methanol? Perhaps, but there are issues with this theory. 
Marx was a qualified and experienced scientist. Those who knew him did not believe it was feasible that he would make such a calamitous error. Also, whilst ethanol and methanol have visible comparability, they are said to have distinct smells and tastes. If Marx had confused the two, the alcohol should have tasted much different, making the mistake obvious. It does not preclude the possibility that an adverse taste was not detected, or that Marx may have made the error despite his experience, but it does suggest that accidental poisoning may not be as clear-cut of a scenario as it may first seem. A second prominent theory regarding Marx's death is that he deliberately consumed the methanol. Living in such extremely remote regions brings with it the understandable sense of complete isolation and loneliness, precursors to depressive episodes that may lead to suicidal ideations. Potential occupants at Antarctic research stations are reportedly physically and psychologically screened beforehand, but the strength of these tests is not known. It has been speculated that Marx may have knowingly consumed methanol either to kill himself or to become sick enough to be sent home. But again, this is problematic. Marx had spent time at the base before, so he was well aware of the effect the location could have. Also, if he had wanted to be sent home, there were far easier ways to fake an illness to achieve this purpose. But perhaps the biggest problem with this theory is that Marx sought medical attention once his symptoms began. If he had knowingly consumed methanol, it is difficult to see why he would do this. Finally, many people have speculated that Marx was, in fact, a murder victim. The media quickly ran with this theory, suggesting that the case may have been the first killing at the South Pole. Others have agreed with such a suggestion over the years, including DSS Wormald, who has always remained steadfast in his belief that Marx unknowingly ingested the chemical. If Marx had been murdered, it would be difficult to construct a suspect pool or posit a motive. The colleagues he had been stationed with at the time have since scattered across the globe, and much time has passed since that day. Because of this, it is difficult to speculate whether this may or may not have been the case. We don't know what happened at the base in the days and weeks before Marx died, nor what happened afterwards. The accuracy of the theory, therefore, remains unclear, but it has not prevented it from becoming one of the most popular suggestions amongst those familiar with the case. 22 years have passed since Rodney Marx sadly succumbed to his illness within the cold, ice-ravished walls of the Amundsen-Scott Station. His body was buried at the Belbray Cemetery in Mount Denide, Victoria, in his native homeland of Australia. A mountain in the Worcester Range was also named Mount Marx in his memory. It stands tall at 8,535 and has a plaque erected at its base bearing his name. Another memorial was created in January 2001 and resides at the South Pole. Sadly, however, we are no nearer to determining exactly how he came to consume the methanol that prematurely ended his life. Perhaps one day the speculation can end and his family will finally have the answers they have sought for so many years. Until then, his mysterious death will continue to remain unsolved. Thank you for watching this video. This case has always fascinated me with its myriad of twists and turns. The thought of something like this happening in a place as remote as the South Pole sends chills down my spine. 
I hope you have enjoyed me narrating this case for you. If you have suggestions for future cases I should cover, please leave them in the comments below. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the future videos I've planned. Once again, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.